Welcome you again this morning to our home online studio of Transformation Church. <laughs> and uh, I pray that all is well with you. I pray that the presence of the Lord is mighty in your heart and in your environment. You know, in the times that we're in, it's so important more than ever before to keep reminding ourselves of the fact that God is good and that His mercy endures forever. So regardless of how you feel, that's a confession you have to make to yourself that your God is a good God and his mercy endures forever. Make that confession every morning you wake up. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. I will be glad in it. Expect good things. Expect favor. Expect God to speak to you. Expect miracles to still happen in your life in spite of what is going on around you. God is good and his mercy endures forever. We always must remind ourselves, encourage ourselves, and bask in the knowledge um, that our God is good and is looking out for you and he has you in mind. Amen. And before I go on with this message, I also want to uh, say a quick thank you to my setup crew. Um, I just sit down behind this lovely camera and speak the word of God to you. But Minister AK, my wife, um, they just take care of everything else and make sure that we're good to go. So give them a virtual pound or high five or call or text. So we have been on the series um, and in the mode of talking about making an impact, being a difference maker, making your life count um, and uh, being productive with everything that God has given you. So we're just going to continue along those lines. And today I'm going to talk about practical steps that we can take to establishing fruitfulness. I'll, uh, I'll piggyback a little bit on what I've shared in the past few weeks and then take it a step uh, further. I believe that this is the season that we're in. This is what God expects of us. God wants your life to be productive. God wants your life to have an impact. So, uh, you know, Give me your ears and open up your heart to receive what God is saying to you. So our foundational scripture uh, text for this message and, you know, the next couple of weeks is in Matthew chapter 25. And I'm going to read verse, verses 14 through 30 in the New Living Translation. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. And he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, or talents, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. That's important to remember. And then he left on a strip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money, and he earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, the master returned from his trip and called him to give an account of how they had used his money. Keep that in mind. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise and he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I have earned two more. And again, the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. So five and two go to celebration. Then the, then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you did not plant and gathering crops you did not cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. 
But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. And then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. And to those who use well what they're given, even more will be given to them and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that whole story is the foundation, is the uh, context for where I will be unpacking some things for us to get. Because I desire and God desires that you live a life of fruitfulness. Your life must be a fruit. There must be tangible evidence that God is with you. There must be tangible evidence that there is something about you that is unusual, that there is something about you that is attractive, that there is something about you that demonstrates to the whole world around you that the hand of the Lord is upon you, that God is with you, that heaven is on your side. You must be productive. The fruit of the Spirit must be manifest and present in your life. There must be testimonies of what God is doing. There must be praise reports of how God has blessed you, how God is using you, of what God is doing in your life. Uh, there must be good works to show that indeed uh, you are a child of God. That's why the scripture says that faith without works is dead. So we're not approved by our good works, but when you have the spirit of God in you, you automatically do good works. So good works must be seen in your life. Your life must be fruitful. Your life must be productive. And today and the next couple of weeks, I'm going to share practical things, steps that you can take to establish fruitfulness in your life. Last week, I shared with you that you already have a foundation of fruitfulness by virtue of the covenant. The same covenant that God had with Abraham, the same covenant that he had with uh, his son, Jesus Christ. You are a beneficiary. You are part of that covenant. The Bible said that we are joint heirs with Christ Jesus. So there is fruitfulness. There is productivity in your DNA. The blessing of the Lord, the hand of the Lord, the power of the Lord, the anointing of God rests over you. So you have no choice but to be a fruitful child of God. Now, how do we work that fruitfulness out? What are the things that we need to do for it to, uh, 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 to show forth? That's what I'll be talking about, those practical steps that we're going to take to establish fruitfulness. We've learned in the past couple of weeks that fruitfulness is the first of the five uh, creational blessings that God pronounced on man. He said, be fruitful uh, 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 and multiply, replenish the earth, subdue and have dominion. Five creational blessings that God pronounced on man. And at the top of that list, the very first one is fruitfulness because God expects us to be fruitful. God didn't pronounce this a blessing over any creature. He didn't pronounce it on the giraffe or the lion or the tiger, the advark. No, God pronounced this blessing only on man. We have a mandate. We have a God uh, 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 ordained mission to be fruitful in the earth, to be productive, for our life to make meaning, for our lives to have impact, for our lives to demonstrate the goodness, the power and the glory of God. This is what God gave to man. God gave man the blessing. He didn't give um, Adam a, a, a spear to hunt with. He didn't give Adam a, a money. He didn't give Adam clothes or shoes or car. He gave him the blessing. And from this blessing has come out all the inventions that we see today from the internet and so on and so forth. All of these things came out as a result of the blessing. So to be fruitful means to have a good testimony. To be fruitful means to have good results in your life. It means to have good, healthy relationships, that your life is flourishing, that your life uh, uh, has favor, that your life has a meaning, that your life someone can look at and say, wow, God is a good God. That your life showcases the, the, the majesty of our Savior. In Psalm 92, and I'm going to read from verse 12 to 14, it says that the righteous will flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God, and they will still bring forth fruit in their old age. They will be fat and flourishing. Why does the Bible compare us to the palm tree? Why is that the illustration that is used to describe the blessed life of God's people? Because the palm tree is a tree that every part of it is useful. 
from the kernel to the leaves to the stem, every part of the palm tree, none of it goes to waste. Every part of it is useful to man. I pray that that blessing would fall over your life, that every part of your being will flourish, that your relationships would flourish, your character will flourish, your ministry will flourish, your children will flourish, your spouse will flourish, the works of your hands, whatever you lay your hands to will flourish, that you will flourish on the job, you will flourish in your education, you will flourish as you serve God, you will flourish in your giving, everything that your hand finds to do, every area of your life will flourish, your life will be useful, just like the palm tree in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that the grace uh, to bear fruit will fall upon you, that that anointing for you to be productive will be released over your life in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your life must be fruitful. Now, when I'm talking about fruitfulness, I'm not talking about, because I talked about be fruitful and multiply. I'm not just talking about uh, 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 bearing kids. I have three myself and I have, you know, a family and friends who have four and, you know, some of them might still be interested in accomplishing that scripture. More grace to you, you all know who you are. I won't say your names here live. Uh, but I'm not just talking about bearing kids when I'm talking about um, fruitfulness. I'm talking about your life being useful in every area. I'm talking about your mind being blessed. I'm talking about your character. I'm talking about your hands, everything that you do, all bearing fruit. I don't know if I have any gardeners that I'm speaking to this morning, but any gardener, any, any, any farmer, anybody who plants something expects to see a fruit. You expect something to come out. If you plant seeds for grass, you expect that your lawn is going to grow uh, some good grass. If you plant um, a coconut tree, since I like coconut so much, <laughs> you expect that uh, um, a coconut is going to sprout out of the ground and you're going to harvest some coconuts. When God, when God the good gardener, when God the good husband man, the Bible calls him, when he invests in your life because you have a seed of righteousness, you have a seed of Christ Jesus on the inside of you, God expects that your life will bear fruit. God expects the seed of the word in you to grow and to bear fruit. Do you know that some Christians are discouraged, they are frustrated, they don't have a testimony, they are unhappy and depressed because they are not bearing fruit? Because as a child of God, if you don't bear fruit, your default setting is to be unhappy because God created you to bear fruits. So when the fruit is absent in your life and when you're not being productive and doing what God has called you to be, uh, uh, what God has called you to do and all he's called you to be, the default setting is for you to be unhappy, it's for you to be, uh, uh, to be discouraged. Let's look in John chapter 15 verse 8. If your Bible is like mine, I'm reading from the King James Version here. You have the words of Jesus in red. This is Jesus speaking. He says, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so shall you be my disciples. So God is glorified when you bear fruits. God wants to be glorified by a life of productivity. God wants your life to have testimonies. God wants to puff out his chest in heaven and look at his son and look at his daughter and, and say, Wow, I'm so proud of you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You are doing exactly what I called you to do. You are, you are, you are being a good uh, 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 a witness for Jesus. You're being a good testimony to the fact that I am God indeed. God expects our lives to bear fruit. He, he's glorified. He's excited. He's happy when we bear fruits. I pray that anointing. I pray that grace. I pray the favor of God to cause you to be a fruit producer, to cause you to be a glory carrier, to cause you to be a light that shines in the darkness, to cause you to be a solution bringer. And God will do it on a higher level. Those of you that are already doing something, those of you who are already bearing good fruit, God is saying you're going to bear much more fruit in the name of Jesus. God is saying it's going to help you to be more productive, to be more fruitful, to be more effective at the work that you're doing for the body of Christ. And when I talk about fruits, I want you to keep in mind that I'm not just talking about uh, money because that's what you know usually comes to people's mind or about getting a new car or a spouse or a house and or, you know, or a new job. And there's nothing wrong with all those things. All those things are good. As a matter of fact, those are byproducts of your uh, Christianity. Those are blessings that follow you as you follow Jesus. 
But when I'm talking about fruitfulness, I'm talking about godly character. I'm talking about um, your speech, that your words are wise words, that your words build people, not tear people down, that your words are well thought out, that they edify those who listen to them. I'm talking about uh, being godly. I'm talking about uh, showing kindness. I'm talking about showing love. I'm talking about uh, 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 manifesting uh, the temperance, the patient, all the characteristics of the fruit of the spirit, Christ-like, uh, Christ-like behavior being seen in your life. That's what a life of fruitfulness is all about. Things about you that will make people be attracted to the God that you worship. Many people look at uh, some of God's children and they want to run in the opposite direction. But I pray that the word of the Lord in Matthew 5, 16 will be your portion, that your light will so shine before men that they will see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven, that there, that there is something about you that would want to draw them to you, and you will now be the signpost that points them to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7, in verses 16 in the A part and in 20, it says that by their fruits you shall know them. So you know people by how they live their lives. You might have encountered some people that say, well, if only you knew what was in my heart. Sweetie, what is in your heart will ultimately find expression in what you say. What is in your heart will ultimately find expression in what you do. By their fruits, you shall know them. You are defined as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, by the fruit that you bear. So the fruit that we bear is important and God is well pleased with us when we bear good fruit. The scripture we read in John chapter 15 verse 8 in the B portion says, And so shall you be called my disciples. Jesus said that when you bear fruit, that's how I define you as my disciples. So you have no right to call yourself a follower of Jesus if you are not bearing fruit. You have no right to say that you are a disciple, that you believe in God, if you are not bearing fruit that show indeed that you are a child of God. I want to ask you a question. Have you had an opportunity where in the month of May to uh, share your faith with at least one person in 2020? Have you had a chance to be a witness, to actively tell someone that Jesus has changed my life, is the God that I worship and follow, and if you trust your life uh, 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 into his hands, he will transform and change forever. Have you have you done that this year? If you haven't, I pray that when we're no longer in quarantine and you get a chance to go out, that you make it your mission to at least win one soul to heaven before this year runs out. That is a life of fruitfulness. That is a life that God is well pleased with. That is a heart that loves God and loves the things that God loves. Those are the people that God pours out resources to. That is taking what God has given you and trading and making more with the resources that he has blessed you with. God is looking for fruit bearers. God is looking for people who manifest fruitfulness. If you don't have a mindset, if you don't have a mentality that your life must bear fruit, your joy will be incomplete. You'll be lacking something. You'll be lacking testimonies. You'll be lacking zeal. You'll be lacking a zest to life. You'll be lacking even the blessings and the fruitfulness, the productivity. Uh, you'll be lacking the flourishing, the, 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 the life of abundance that comes like the palm tree when you are not bearing fruit. Because all those things come along with a life that is determined and purposefully wants to bear fruit for Jesus. So what are the things that we can do to establish fruitfulness? I'm going to share three with you, but for today's message, I'm only going to share, get, probably get a chance to just share one of them, and I'm going to pick this up next week. So how do you bear fruit? What are the steps that you take? I'm going to share three things that have helped me, and I'm just going to uh, release one of them. Now, the parable that I read with you earlier on in Matthew 25, I'm sure you all figure out, uh, have figured out by now that it is speaking the merchant there um, who goes on the long trip, obviously, um, is God. And um, the, the servants that he gave the talents, that he gave the silver to, are you and me. Amen. And we saw that the servant who had five talents traded with the five talents and got five more, and God praised them. Welcome, let's celebrate. You've done a great job. The servant with two talents did the same thing. He traded with the two talents that he had got uh, from God, and he made two more. God blessed them. Let's celebrate together. But the, talent with the, the, the servant with the one talent 
hit it in the ground and gave a wrong testimony about God. He said God was wicked and unfaithful and so reaps where he doesn't so and all manner of silly things that this joker said. So let's look at the things that we can do to establish fruitfulness. Number one, recognize, appreciate, and utilize who you are and what you have. I'll say that again. Recognize, appreciate, and utilize who you are and what you have. This parable that we just read shows us that God gives us everything that we need to do what we have to do. God gives us everything that we need to do what we have to do. No child of God comes empty. Every child of God is loaded with resources to accomplish your purpose. Every child of God has divine abilities that God has given you. I have gifts that God has given me. You have gifts and talents and abilities that I could never dream of being able to walk in that God has given you. And they are a, a tailor made and unique to you for your purpose. So if you're going to be fruitful, if you're going to take a step to establish fruitfulness, you have to recognize, appreciate, and utilize who you are and what you have. The first step is to recognize it. The next step is to make sure you appreciate it and then begin to use it. It is estimated that a talent is worth about $1 million. So all the servants had a lot to work with. It's not about the number. So don't feel like, well, I have just one talent. He has five talents. She has two talents. It's not about the number. It's about God giving them in proportion to what they're able to handle. It's about what you do with it. So the guy who had one talent had about a million dollars to trade with. There was an expectation that when the merchant gave the, the talents to the servants, that they would trade with it, that they would come back and give an account and be good stewards of what was given to them. As a matter of fact, the guy with the one talent probably had it good because with more, uh, with more gifting comes more responsibilities. So the guy who had five talents, the guy who had two talents, had a lot more work to do to trade and to make more with what they were given than the guy with the one talent. Let's look at a scripture in Ephesians chapter 5. I mean, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. Because I need you to know that God is a fair God, if you did not know that already. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So God gives us a, a talent according to our abilities. God knows what you can handle. So child of God, anything that you're doing for the kingdom is because God knows that you can handle it. It's because God, it's because God knows that you're able to use fully, you're able to utilize and to be a blessing with what he has given to you. So nobody comes empty handed. All of us have the grace of God. All of us have that ability on the inside of us. Say this with me. Say, I have something. Say it again. Say, I have something. You are loaded with possibilities. You are loaded with potential. You are loaded with power. You can change the world with the abilities and talents that God has given you. You have something. God is a fair God. God is equitable. He is righteous and just. So he gives each one of us talent according to our abilities. But the problem with the guy with one talent is that he was suffering from a spirit of insignificance. And that is a problem that is uh, uh, pervading the church. That is the problem with a lot of God's people. Do you know that we are all called ministers of reconciliation? It's not just the pastor. We think that prayer is just for the prayer minister, that the preaching of the word is just for the pastor. The pastor is the one supposed to lay hands and heal the sick. No, we are all ministers. We're all ministers, all beats in different capacities, but God has gifted every single one of us with abilities. He had a spirit of insignificance. He looked at what he had and he devalued it. He looked at what he had and he felt, this is nothing, I have just one talent. May God deliver us. May God purge out. May God cast out the spirit of insignificance out of our lives in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Some Christians, you can look at your marital status. Oh, I'm single. And you devalue yourself. 
Oh, I'm married, I'm not happy, and you devalue yourself. Oh, I don't have my papers yet, and you devalue yourself. Or you look at your sex, your height, your weight, and you devalue yourself. No, child of God, you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. You are carrying power. You are carrying greatness. You have something. Don't underestimate yourself. Don't look down on what God has given to you. Because the spirit of insignificance leads to comparisons. You start comparing yourself with the next person. It leads to a lack of focus. So the time and energy that you're supposed to use to develop your talents, the time and energy that you're supposed to invest in yourself, you're using that to be envious, you're deflecting, you're procrastinating, you're casting blame, and you're looking everywhere around instead of looking up to God, the one who has gifted you. God is saying to you this morning that to avoid stagnation, to avoid frustration, to avoid being stuck in the pit, recognize what you have, appreciate what you have, utilize what you have. It's very common for couples after a long time, you know, you've seen your husband, you've seen your wife in the morning when they haven't brushed their teeth, you've seen, you know, seen her after she's taken off, you know whatever she put on, you know, uh, 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 you've been used to hearing this message and now you take it for granted. You've heard the scripture before you take it for granted, you know, take for granted your house. People would kill to want to be where you are. Even your job, you get used to it and just take it for granted. And the people who are looking for jobs, don't devalue, don't take for granted. Don't underestimate what you have. Don't let the spirit of insignificance creep in. Bless God and appreciate your spouse, your home, your car, your job, whatever it is that God has given you, your boss. Thank God for them. Tell them, thank you, you're doing a good job. The feedback that you're giving to me is helpful and you're helping my career. Appreciate what you have. Don't underestimate, don't devalue what God has given to you. If you're going to be fruitful, the, the, the being and the knowing takes precedent over the doing. What do I mean by that? We are human beings, we are not human doings. In Daniel chapter 11 verse 32, he says that they that know their God, they shall be strong and carry out great exploits. So the knowing is the prerequisite for the doing. When you know, you will do. When you believe right, you will do right. So you have to know who you are. You have to know uh, 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 what you have. When you have that persuasion and that conviction and revelation, then you can carry on and do what God has called you to do. So if you are going to be fruitful, the priority is on the knowing and the being over the doing because that leads to the doing. That scripture that we just read says that when you know your God and you do exploits, you don't do exploits to know your God. When you know the God that you serve and what is placed on the inside of you, then you carry out great exploits. You have to know who you are and be persuaded that the challenges of life cannot cancel out the deposits of God that's on the inside of you. You must be persuaded that your, your, your destiny, that your calling will drown out the circumstances, that your destiny, that your anointing would overpower whatever comes against you. You have to know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You must be persuaded that Jesus, uh, uh, that, that when Jesus said that be of good cheer, I've overcome the world, that that word is true. That when you face oppositions, when you face afflictions, that you won't run from them, you will vanquish them. God will help you to overcome it. Like I shared last week, what we're going through, you will go through. You, uh, what, what you are going through, you will grow through. God won't waste this COVID season. God won't waste your quarantine. God won't waste uh, the trials and the tribulations and the testings that you're going through right now. You're going to come out blessed. You're going to come out uh, gr uh, growing stronger. You're going to come out with a testimony on the other side in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is out of that knowing that you do. The revelation of your knowing and being enhances your doing. Child, you are made in the likeness of God. This servant did not recognize who he was. He failed to appreciate and to maximize what he was given. I pray that that will not be your portion in the name of Jesus. I pray that the Holy Spirit begins to uh, open up your eyes, that you will see what God has given you, that you will value it, that you will take care of it, that you would invest time in developing 
your talent, you, you, that you invest time in developing who God has called you to be, that you will develop your leadership ability, that you will develop your, your music ministry, your instrument that you play, that you develop your public speaking, you develop your service, you develop your technical skills, whatever it is that they might be. And I pray that God will bless you as you do that, that fruitfulness will be established in your life in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to just go ahead and pause there right now, and I'm going to uh, pick this up um, next week. I want to declare God's blessing, God's favor over you as you enter into this coming week. May you have testimonies and praise reports. May the Holy Spirit work in you and through you and for you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to join us in giving, we believe that our giving is part of our worship. We are a church that is excited and blessed to give to our God. There should be information on your screen, uh, the number you can text your givings to, and also you can give on your website. And what do we give? We give our tithe with the 10% of your earnings, and we also give offerings. May God honor you as you honor him and show love to him. And I look forward to catching up with you again next week. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you, lift up his countenance over you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is well with you. God bless you.